Grace and peace to you, friends. Welcome back to the Oak Tree Journeys. I'm Mandy Oaks, and we are continuing our Encyclopedia Challenge. If this is your first time here, you're probably scratching your head or squinting your nose and wondering, what in the world is the Encyclopedia Challenge? Glad you asked. It's simply this. I read the Encyclopedia to you. I'm reading from two different ones, the New Imperial Encyclopedia and Dictionary of 1909, and the Encyclopedia Americana from 1956. Our main source, until I'm out of volumes, because <laughs> I don't have the entire set, unfortunately, or if I do, they're hidden somewhere, <clears throat> um, is the New Imperial Encyclopedia and Dictionary of 1909, which will be the only one that we'll look at today. Sometimes um, I will switch back and forth, uh, but I'll let you know when I do that. Uh, you can follow along if you want, um, but it's not required um, by any means, because I don't even know if the New Imperial Encyclopedia and Dictionary of 1909 is even still ex in existence. I've looked it up, and I've seen one or two here and there, um, and like a whole set except minus one, um, which I should probably check into, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, but uh, even though... You you know, you don't have to follow along, but you, you can if you want to. I hope that that uh, this sparks more interest in words that you perhaps didn't know. Um, and what I hope you're able to, to do is to look deeper into those. Uh, if you're like me and your time is limited, though, uh, if there's a word or person or place or thing, etc. that you want to dive deeper into, but you, like I said, you just don't have the time. Um, let me know. Send me a message via my website uh, in the contact me section of theoaktreejourneys.com. Again, that is theoaktreejourneys.com. And that website is actually listed in the description below. Um, and, I'll, and I am planning on having a bonus podcast of uh, when we get to five words. Now, I will have a bonus podcast prior to that. Um, something special. Very excited about it. Not going to say anything about it right now, but it will be strictly on the podcast and not on YouTube. Um, um, but I will have a bonus podcast once we hit five words. Um, and if you go to the website and go to Encyclopedia Challenge, you'll see some of the words starred. Those are going to be our bonus words. Um, and the more words we get on there, you'll see more stars. So I'm very, very excited. Um, and I just have to say, uh, before I forget, happy July 1st. Um, and, and happy uh, NaNoWriMo or Camp NaNoWriMo uh, day to all my fellow writers out there. I'm not participating this year. Uh, however, if you are participating, good luck and may the muses be kind to you. Because uh, I know it is a challenge to fit everything in your writing, career, schoolwork if you're a college student and attending summer school. Uh, I know it's hard, so congratulations on doing Camp NaNoWriMo. I've got fond memories of it. Uh, I just don't have time to do it this year, though. Uh, but as a special July 1st episode, we are going to tackle 39, yes, that's right, 39 encyclopedic encyclopedic entries today um and i hope i hope that the one thing that you brought with you today is excitement because i am very excited to dive into this and because i'm excited we're going to go ahead and jump right on in so our first word is actually a name um and that is Abercr abercrombie john joseph that's not Abercrombie and Finch, which or Fitch or whatever it is, like I keep running through my mind, but Abercrombie John Joseph. And he lived from 1802 to 1877. On January 3rd, uh, he was born in Tennessee. He was a general of the USA. He graduated at West Point in 1822. In 1825, to, oh, I thought that said 23, 1823, and I'm like, what? Because this is a 1909 uh, encyclopedia and dictionary, it, it is a little difficult to decipher sometimes. Um, but it's, uh, he graduated at West Point in 1822. 
1835 to 1833, served as adjutant in the 1st Infantry, being promoted captain in 1836. That's pretty cool. Uh, after service in the Florida War, in which he was made brevet major, he was engaged on the frontier in 1845 to 1848, served in the Mexican War, and afterward till 1860 at different stations. He served through the Civil War, was wounded at Fair Oaks, breveted brigade general, I guess, and retired 1865, June 12th. And if you are in the military and I'm messing some of these up, please let me know, and I'm very sorry about that. Okay, and the second word is another name, and again, it's Abercrombie. Uh, this one is Sir Ralph. <clears throat> and again, he is a soldier. Um, a little bit uh, further back into time, 1734, October 7th to 1801, March 28th, born in Minstry, Clack Manninshire in Scotland. He studied for the Barrett, the Universities of Edinburgh and Leipzig, but turned to a military life, and in 1758 went to Germany as a cornet in the 3rd Dragoon Guards. His conduct in the unfortunate campaign, especially during the disastrous retreat in the winter of 1794 and 1795, won him the love and admiration of the army. In command of the expedition to the West Indies, he took Granada, Demera, Esquibo, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Trinidad. As commander of the forces in Ireland, his manly remonstrances against the policy of government toward that country occasioned his removal to a similar command in Scotland. On his return from an expedition to Holland, he was appointed to command the expedition to the Mediterranean in 1799. His fleet anchored in Abercor Bay in 1801, March the 2nd. On March 13th, he drove away the enemy within the lines of Alexandria. On the 21st, in the glorious repulse of the enemy's attempt to surprise the British camp, Abercrombie was struck by a musket ball in the thigh, but not till he saw the enemy retreating did he show any sign of pain. Then he was born from the field. Seven days afterward, he died of the wound. Abercrombie was at once gentle and brave, clear-sighted and cool, prompt and daring. He was also a man of liberal accomplishments. A parage was conferred on his widow. Sounds like a really neat person to have known. Okay, and the next word is Aberde Aberdare, which is a town in the county of Glamorgan, about four miles southwest of Merthyr Tidville. Coal and iron are abundant in the vicinity, coal being largely exported. Aberdare, which is connected with the coast both by rail and canal, is a flourishing center of iron and tin works. The town was kept pace with the development of its industries. It has many substantial buildings, it is well supplied with water, and possesses a public park. The population there in the 1900s was 35,533. Need one second to grab some hot tea, and we'll move on. <clears throat> okay, and next we have a chief city, which is called Aberdeen. Aberdeen was the chief city and seaport in the north of Scotland, is in the southeast angle of the county at the mouth of the River Dee, which forms its harbor, and 111 miles north of Edinburgh. Its mean annual temperature is 45 degrees 0.8 Fahrenheit, and rain rainfall 30.57 inches. William the Lion made Aberdeen a royal burg in 1179. The English burned Aberdeen in 1336, but it was soon rebuilt and called New Aberdeen. Old Aberdeen, with the same parliamentary boundary, is a small town a mile to the north, near the mouth of the, the Don. King's College and University founded in Old Aberdeen, 1494, and Mar Marischal College and University, founded in New Aberdeen, 1593, were in 1860 united into one institution, the University of Aberdeen. 
It has a large faculty in council, excuse me, it has a large faculty and from 800 to 1,000 students on its roll. And its general council with that of Glasgow University sends one member to Parliament. Oh, that's neat. In the 17th century, Aberdeen had become an important place, but it suffered much from both parties in the civil wars. It has now a flourishing trade and large manufactures, and its handsome light gray granite architecture is much admired. The harbor has been much enlarged and deepened, and a new breakwater has been built. The chief exports are linens, woolens, cotton yarns, paper, combs, granite, hewn and polished, cattle, grain, preserved provisions, and fish. Aberdeen has the largest comb and granite polishing works in the kingdom. It has considerable iron works and much shipbuilding. The Aberdeen clipper bow ships are celebrated as fast sailors. Aberdeen has above 60 places of worship and 10,000 children at school. Population in 1871 Municipal Burg, 76,348. Parliamentary, 88,125. In 1881, Parliamentary, 105,003. In 1901, 143,722. <clears throat> Alright, and next is Aberdeen again. However, this is a city capital. So, Aberdeen a city capital of Brown County, South Dakota, on the Chicago and Northwestern, the Northern Pacific, the Chicago, Milwaukee, oh, Milwaukee and St. Paul, the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba, and the Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Salt Street, Marie Railroads, popularly called the Railroad Hub of the Dakotas. It contains three national banks, capital $225,000, one private bank, capital $100,000, three grain elevators, three large hotels, three railroad depots, railroad roundhouse and freight houses, U.S. land office, six churches, three graded public schools, Academy of the Sacred Heart, Roman Catholic, seven daily and weekly newspapers, two electric light plants, Water supply from several artisan wells driven by the James River Valley and substantial business and residence building buildings. Aberdeen is the entrepot of <laughs> uh, for a large agricultural lumber and commercial trade. Population in 1880 was 2,500. 1890, 3,182. 1900, 4,087. 1903, 5,572. Okay, and next we have, you guessed it, another Aberdeen, this time a person. Aberdeen George Hamilton Gordon, Earl of. And that's what it says, Earl of, and it just has a colon <laughs> uh, and dates. So 1784 to 1860, born in Edinburgh, educated at Harrow and at St. John's College, Cambridge, where he took his degree of, mass, uh, um, of MA in 1804. He succeeded to the earldom in 1801 and traveled in Greece, as noted in Byron's line, quote, the traveled Thane Athenian Aberdeen, end quote. He entered public life as a Tory in 1806, was entrusted with a delicate mission to Austria in 1813, and after the war was elevated to the, this is volume one through three for some reason, um, I think that's a typo. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of typos here, but okay. It does continue. And after the war was elevated to the British Parage as Viscount Gordon, in 1828, he took office in the new ministry under the Duke of Wellington. The general principle of his policy as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs was that of non-interference in the internal affairs of foreign states, which joined to his well-known sympathy with such statesmen as Metternich was exposed him, or has exposed him, not always justly, to the suspicion of being inimical to the cause of popular liberty. His gradual abandonment of high Tory principles was evinced by his support of the Bill for the Repeal of the Test and Cooperation Acts and of the Roman Catholic Emancipation Act. From the fall of the Wellington Ministry till the Peel Administration in 1841, Aberdeen was out of office, with the exception of his brief administration of the colonial office in the Tory ministry of 1834 and 1835. 
1841, he again received the seals of the Foreign Office. M. Guzot was at that time foreign minister in France, and the two statesmen acted in cordial alliance. In conclusion of the Chinese War, the Ashburton Treaty and the Oregon Treaty were the principal services rendered <clears throat> excuse me, to the country during his administration of foreign affairs. From the time that the repeal of the Corn Laws became the rallying point of the Peel Party, he was in accord with their policy. In 1846, he resigned with Sir Robert Peel. In 1853, on the resignation of Lord Derby, the extraordinary state of parties necessitated a coalition, and Aberdeen was selected as the fittest man to head the new ministry, which for some time was extremely popular. The feeble and vacillating policy in the conduct of the war with Russia gradually undermined its stability, and the disastrous mismanagement brought to light in the winter of 1854 in all departments of the public business connected with the war filled up with a measure of the popular discontent. In 1855, February 1st, Aberdeen resigned office. He was author of an essay on Grecian architecture in 1822. And the next one does have Aberdeen in the title. However, the full one is Aberdeen Shire, which is a large maritime county in the east of Scotland between 56 degrees 52 and 57 degrees 42 north latitude and 1 degree 49 and 3 degrees 48 west long, long, long longitude, bounded north by Ben of Shire and the North Sea, east by the North Sea, south by the Kincardine, Forfar and Perth Shires, west by Inverness and Ben of Shires. It is the fifth in size of the Scottish counties, greatest length 102 miles, greatest breadth 59 miles, with 60 miles of sea coast and an area of 1966 square miles. It has long been popularly divided into five districts proceeding from southwest to northeast. Mar, Strathbogie, Gerich, Formarenton, and Buchanan, Aberdeenshire is generally hilly and in the southwest, Bromer entirely mountainous. Mount <laughs> contains lots of mountains. <laughs> the Grampanians running along the south side and branching off to the northeast and north, Bromer contains the highest mountains, Ben Much Du, next to Ben Nevis, the highest hill in the British Isles, 4,296 feet, Corntal, 4,241 feet, Corn Gorm, 4,084 feet, Ben Nabird, 3,924 feet, Loch Nagar, 3,786 feet. The predominant rocks are granite and Guinness. The granite is very durable and is much used for building and polishing. The chief rivers are the D, 87 miles long, Don, 83 miles long, and Ethan, 35 miles, which run eastward into the North Sea, and the Do Doveran, 62 miles, which runs northeast into the North Sea, see D, Don, Doveran. On the upper part of the D is Balmorel. The Yithin yields the pearl mussel, but rarely pearls of any value. The mean annual rainfall of Aber Aberdeenshire varies from 30 to 37 inches. Clay soils predominate near the coast, loamy soils near the center, and poor gravelly sandy and peaty soils elsewhere. The most fertile parts lie between the Don and the Yithin, and in the northeast angle of the county. Nowhere in the kingdom have the natural disadvantages of soil and climate been more successfully overcome. Aberdeenshire has 188 miles of railway and 2,359 miles of public roads, the latter supported by rates and not by to tolls. The chief towns and villages are Aberdeen, New and Old, Peterhead, Fraserburgh, Huntley, Kintour, Inveree, and Turuff. The county returns two members to Parliament, the city of Aberdeen two, and the burghs of Peterhead, Kintour, and Inverie, with Elgin, Colon, and Banff. One. Okay. About 37% of the area of Aberdeenshire is cultivated. Recently, it had 195,316 acres in oats. 
16,564 in barley, and it's kind of scratched off. It looks like beer, B-E-R-E, 92,972 in turnips, and 152,106 cattle. Aberdeenshire produces one-fifth of the turnips and one-seventh of the cattle reared in Scotland and is unsurpassed in breeding and feeding stock. The fisheries on the coast are very productive. Above 80% of the children 5 to 13 years are at school. The Dick and Milne bequests of periodical schoolmasters have given Aberdeenshire a high place in the statistics of education. Aberdeenshire has about 290 places of worship, 105 being established and 100 free. Value of real property exclusive of railways over... Um, I'm guessing that's pounds, 831,333. The population in 1891, 281,331. And in 1901, 304,439. Okay, there's a lot there about Aberdeenshire. Okay, and the next one is a songbird. It is Aberdeen, Aber Divine, or the Siskin. A songbird, nearly allied to the goldfinch, which is placed by Cuvier and others in the New Guinness Cardiolis. It is rather smaller than the goldfinch and less elongated in form. The crown of the head and the throat are black, the nape dusky green, and there is a broad yellow beak above and behind each eye. It is only a winter visitant of Britain and breeds in the north of Europe, building its nest in high trees. It is frequently kept as a cage bird, being easily tamed, and breeds freely with the canary. It feeds on the seeds of the thistle, al alder, or alder, birch, and elm, and occasionally does great damage to the hop plantations in, in Germany. In France, it injures the blossoms of the apple trees. And the next one is a market town. It's Aber... Gainey. So, and it's not spelled that way. It's Abergainey is what the pronunciation is telling me. Okay. It is a market town of England in Monmouthshire, 13 miles west of Monmouth, beautifully situated in the valley of the Usk, the Garden of Wells, at the junction of the Usk and Gavany, and is surrounded by high mountains and thick woods. The town is regularly and com Compactly built, St. Mary's Church, formerly a fine cruciform structure containing many interesting monuments, has been seriously marred by alterations. The castle, which is very ancient, is now a ruin. The principal modern building is the Lunatic Asylum. Oh, that, that's uh, something to boast about, <laughs> that your principal modern building is an asylum for lunatics. There are collieries and ironworks in the neighborhood. The hair... Hereford and Tredegar Railway passes near the town. The population is about 8,000. I wonder how many of those are in the Lunatic Asylum. Um, Abernathy, John, from 1764 to 1831, born in London, died in Enfield, eminent English surgeon. His grandfather was the Reverend John Abernathy, an Irish Presbyterian, clergyman who acquired distinction by his writings and his bold ad adoption of Bishop Howley's views on the right of private judgment and the subscription of confessions. Abernathy's early taste disposed him to the bar, but in 1780 he was apprenticed to Mr. afterwards Sir Charles Blick, surgeon of the St. Barth Bartholomew's Hospital. In 1787, he was elected assistant surgeon to St. Bartholomew's, an office which he filled for 28 years, at the end of which time he was appointed surgeon. So imagine going to, being under someone for 28 years until you're finally, finally considered a surgeon. I thought it took me a long time to go to school. Soon after his election, he began to lecture in the hospital on anatomy and surgery, and may be said to have laid the foundation of its character as a school of surgery. At first, he manifested extraordinary diffidence, but his power soon developed itself, 
and his lectures attracted such crowds that in 1790 it was his le- let's see it was found necessary to build a lecture theater in the hospital for his use his clear simple and positive style made him the most popular medical teacher of his day in 1813 he was appointed surgeon to Christ's hospital and in 1814 professor of anatomy and surgery to the college of surgeons his practice increased with his celebrity which the singular eccentricity and occasional rudeness of his manners contributed to heighten of his works the most original and important is his observations in the constitutional origin and treatment of local diseases first published in 1806 in which a simple principle Till then, little attended to was made the foundation of a much important and ingenious observation. His lectures on the theory and practice of surgery were published in 1830. Wow. <clears throat> okay, and the next word is a noun, which is aberration. And let's see, it's a wandering from the right way as from truth moral perversity, mental weakness, and apparent motion of the fixed stars resulting from the fact that the earth moves forward while light is coming from the star. Aberrant is differing widely, differing from the customary structure or type, especially in case of animals and plants. Abering is wandering. Aberrance, also aberrancy, is a wandering from the right way. Aberration of light, the Deviation of rays of light from a true focus due to an equal refractiveness of rays of different wavelengths or uncorrected sphere- sphericity of the lens resulting in an indistinct or colored image appears in the human eye if one examines in a bright light some object with a sharp outline held near an eye. I'm not sure why they chose there to define aberration, aberration of light because there is a whole section we're getting ready to read called aberration of light. Okay, so the next one is mental aberration, a wandering or unsettled state of the mind resulting in in incapacity for ordinary mental efforts. Spherical aberration, in optics, the dispersion of the rays of light in passing through a lens, synonym of aberration, madness, insanity, mania, idiocy, alienation, derangement, lunacy, or dementia. All right, and... As I just mentioned, the next entry is his aberration of light. So here we go. This is a really long one. An apparent alteration in the place of a star arising from the motion of the earth in its orbit combined with a progressive passage of light. When rain is following perpendicularly, a drop entering at the top of an upright tube at rest will go through, but if the tube is carried forward horizontally, a drop entering the top will strike against the side before it goes far, and to make the drop go through the tube in motion, we must incline the top of it forward in the direction of the motion. The amount of this inclination will be the greater, the more rapid the motion of the tube is compared with that of the falling, falling drops. If in the time that a drop takes to fall through the height AB of the parallelogram in the annexed cut, the inclined tube BC is moved horizontally over a space equal to its breadth. AC, a drop entering the top of the tube, will descend without touching the sides. And there's just a very small diagram. Um, basically, AB is the rod upright. Uh, BC, it's uh, at the same point that B is originally in with A, and then it's just kind of makes a V, um, and then the the next one, another BC with the D, is a little further out. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, for in half the time, the tube will be in the position BC and the drop in the position D, and so for any other portion of the time. This exactly illustrates the astronomical phenomenon in question. The tube is a telescope directed to receive the light of a star. This tube and the person looking through it are moving with the earth in its orbit, and the light may be conceived as particles coming from the star like drops of rain, 
moving much faster, no doubt, still requiring time, that a particle or ray of light from the star may, be, may pass through the tube, it must be directed, not straight to the star, but at a slight angle in the direction of the Earth's motion. Thus, the place where we see the star is not its true place. As the Earth's motion, however, is slow compared with the velocity of light, the angle of inclination is small, never exceeding about 20 inches. The result is that if we conceive the true place of a star as a fixed point, the apparent place of the star describes about this true place in the course of a year an ellipse whose greater axis is about 40 inches. The aberration of light was discovered by the English astronomer Bradley in 1727 while seeking to determine the parallax of certain fixed stars. So there we go. It's all about aberration of light, and I'm sure there's way, way more than what's even in here. All right, and the next one is a name. Abert John James, who was a soldier, uh, looks like he was born in 1788, on September 17th. He died 1863, September 27th. He was born in Shepherdstown, Virginia. His father, John Abbott, came to America in 1780 with Count de Rochambeau. Abbott studied at West Point, where he graduated in 1811. That sounds like a very popular place, um, West Point, to study and obtained a position in the War Department at Washington. He studied law and was admitted to practice in the District of Columbia two years later. He had resigned from the Army on leaving West Point, but on the outbreak of the War of 1812, enlisted as a private in 1814, was appointed a topographical engineer with the rank of major. He was placed in charge of the Topographical Bureau of 1829 and promoted to colonel and rendered highly efficient service in supervising important national engineering works until 1861 when he was retired. Okay, how about we do two more and then we'll take a break. <clears throat> okay, and next is another person. This time, instead of a soldier, we have a civil engineer. Abert Sylvanus Thayer, civil engineer, born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 1828 on July 22nd, Son of John J. Abbott, he graduated at Princeton, adopted the profession of engineering, and was employed by the government in constructing the James River and Kanawha Canal, and continued in the government service being appointed in 1859 construction engineer at the Pensacola Navy Yard. He served during the Civil War, and 1865 to 1866 was in the employ of the Colombian government, and later in the U.S. Engineering Corps. Corpse. He wrote note historical and statistical on the projected route for an interoceanic ship canal between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans in 1872. Okay, and our next and last one before break is Abertswith. So Abertswith is a seaport of Wales and one of the Cardigan District of Parliamentary Boroughs. In a single year, over 400 vessels of a total tonnage of more than 30,937 tons enter the port. Abersenthwit <laughs> is much resorted to for sea bathing and is well provided with good hotels and lodging houses. Population is about 7,000. And with that, I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be with you shortly. Hi, I hope you enjoyed that segment from my podcast, The Oak Tree Journeys, from the Encyclopedia Challenge. To hear the entire episode, please visit the link at the bottom in the description. And please don't forget to like this video, give it a thumbs up, and subscribe and share it to anyone you know who wants to, to read the entire encyclopedia or who's just interested in words. Thank you again and have a blessed day.